I just want to tell you that you take a tremendous risk this morning asking an Irishman to come up with revolutionary thinking. <laughs> so I want to just alter the logo a little bit, and I want to talk about the revolutionary with a small r, because I think that what I'm going to talk about is more evolutionary, but it does have revolutionary elements, because it does talk about some fundamental change. And it, it all comes really from the learning that you have over the years. I'm about to become 70, so um, I've had many years of learning, hopefully many years of learning. And it goes back to a background that I, I had in terms of my education. I'm actually a qualified social worker, although I was reminded tonight I probably hadn't done all the updates on legislation, so I wouldn't be able to practice anymore. But uh, I, I actually came from that background and came into business that way, which, as you probably know, is fairly unusual. And therefore, through my life, I was always looking at what was the impact of what I was doing having upon people in society. And I was once, I went back to my old university and I saw my sociology prof. And he said, you know, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm working for Coca-Cola. And he said, you're what? Because he came from the old school. He came from the business doesn't do any good school of sociology. And I said to him, prof, I firmly believe that I'm going to positively affect more lives working for Coca-Cola than I will ever do as a social worker. And I was in my 20s at that time, and, and, and I'd thought it through to that stage. So it's evolved into that last chapter of my book, which I call Connected Capitalism, but that was four years ago when I first wrote that, and it's evolved from there. It's based on a speech that I made at the Council on Foreign Relations actually almost exactly four years ago today. So it's old news. But if you go back to 2009, there were dark times. And we've seen the effect of those dark times in terms of not just what's happened to the world and what's happened to the economies of the world and the struggles that are ongoing as we you know, wait to see what's going to happen in, in Europe with regard to Cyprus and whether that collapses. The effects of bad business practice, the effects of the excess of capitalism in many ways, and just human nature. Really, the original capitalism, you know, red and tooth and claw. And we haven't been able to capture that or control that in the right way, and we've gone through these continuing evolutions of bad practice, which sullies the practitioners of business, and they're the majority of the practitioners of business, who really work in business as a force for good. So we've had the Enrons, and then we've had the banks, and I'm not going to rail on about what happened, because we all know what happened. But it makes you think about how do you protect the engine of growth that is called capitalism? Because what's evolved from 2009, and was apparent in 2009, is that capitalism is under threat. And I'm talking to a business school, and we all believe that the, the way to bring people out of poverty is to give them opportunity. That's why we're talking about social entrepreneurship. And to me, the market mama in Ghana selling her wares is a capitalist. She's a businesswoman, just as I became a businessman with Coca-Cola. Now, largely today, I'm not going to talk about the beginning of the pyramid, I'm going to talk about really larger companies and what I mean by connected capitalism. But what I saw as I moved, I've lived in 11 countries on five continents. What I saw when things were really, really worked well was when business, civil society, and governments got out of their silos and worked effectively together. And I think one of the biggest problems we have is that we're still in the silos. And that that connectivity, which 
is essential to be able to deliver against the major problems that we face in the world today, how we feed 9 billion people. We need, you know, five planets to do that if we do it the way that we're doing it today. All of those huge issues are best solved if the specific skills, and they're very different skills, that the business community can bring, that civil society, and I include not just the NGO world, but academia within that, it's a broad church, and church I put in there too, and government. And the interesting part of that, that evolution is that I think there are two pieces that are leading the way, and that's business and NGOs and academia. And that the laggard is government. And that's the challenge that I don't have an answer to today, but I think that we need to debate about how we can get government better into that equation. I'm going to come to that later on. But let me take the business side of the equation, because I talk from the, the business side. The whole idea of the three coming together, which, you know, we talk about the, the, the triangle, the triangle here, I call it the, the triangle of sustainability. And that is the three points of the triangle, business, civil society, and um, government. If you as a businessman then start becoming involved in looking at some of these problems and issues of the world, you start getting accused of moving away from the clear purpose that has been set for the corporation. You come up against what in economics is called agency theory. You come up against Milton Friedman. And sometimes you would say against Adam Smith, although he wrote some very good social treatises himself. But you're against this whole idea that the only thing when you are running a major corporation that you should be doing is serving the interests of the shareholders. Now, see, my definition of serving the interests of the shareholders is different to the way that that is interpreted in general terms today. Because it's interpreted as serving the interests of the shareholders in the short term. And I'm not against quarterly earnings reports, but I am against judging where a corporation is in terms of only financial metrics, purely financial metrics that drive an economic model that drives the stock price. I am for looking after the shareholders in terms of the long-term sustainability of the business. That to me is what's important. And I was very lucky to have on my board Warren Buffett, who not only believes in that, has acted upon that in his own private way, but also has made a great deal of money by backing companies that he feels have got sustainability in the long term. Now, there are requirements with regard to the sustainability because it is not, I agree, the purpose of a corporation to be trite about it, to save the world. But it is the responsibility of business not only to understand where they have a negative footprint and rectify that negative footprint, but to look at the areas where they therefore need to be sure that the right policies are, being, are taking place and that they are protecting core assets that they use. So what do I mean by that? At Coca-Cola Company, the number one area that we chose for the company to be involved in was water. And it has all evolved, I mean this was a journey, to some pretty outrageous promises that we, that we made. The first one we made was that by 2015, and this is easily going to be met, that all of the water that was used in all of the production processes of the 1,000 factories around the world would be returned to nature in nature identical form. And that took an awful lot of investment. It took an awful lot of argument because in, we deal with the franchise system. We deal with people who are investing their own money in the business. We're asking them to put capital in. And they're saying, well, you know, we, we 
sort of clean up the water right now in the river we put it into. I mean, it's, it's black with oil. I mean, we improve, we improve the water. No, that's not the standard. The standard has to be something that's nature identical. And that's looking at that negative footprint, putting that right. But then you think, you know, there's another stage. What about the product that we get people to consume? And you can imagine the debate where we said, well, we're going to, we're going to go by 2020, and we're going to say that we are actually going to be completely water neutral. So we will replace, and I'll come to that in a second, we will replace the water that we sell by reforestation, by getting legitimacy about what we're doing with watersheds and protecting watersheds, getting that calculated almost like a carbon credit, and therefore having complete water neutrality. And my successor, who has taken everything to the next level, uh, is absolutely convinced that that is going to be met. But there's another stage that you go to. You say, well, okay, that's, that's us. What about our suppliers? What about the fact that one of the ingredients, and I'm not going to go into the obesity debate, but it's sugar. It's the thirstiest crop around. So one of the projects that we into with Cargill, and which is now in, in the marketplace, it, it's more expensive, we'll get the cost down, is a new strain of sugar that uses 30% less water. So you think about your whole, your whole value chain now in terms of sustainability. So this is, this is great, and we get to make great speeches, and we go to, uh, we team up with the World Wildlife Fund, and we do some great things, and then I go to an investor conference. And guess what happens? There's an analyst who says, Mr. Isdell, how can you justify all this money that you are spending on water? This is shareholder money, and you are only going after a social purpose, which is not, a, that's, that's not how you should be spending shareholder money. And I will reenact. I got my coat very deliberately. And I said, don't you think I should be worried about one of my key ingredients? People don't think of water as a key ingredient. And you know, I never got that question ever again. So that really defines what the what the, how you qualify, how you spend the share of money, and how you become involved in the broader societal problems that clearly need to be solved. It needs to be core to strategy. You need to have what I call line of sight. And if you don't have that, then we're into what we call corporate social responsibility. And, you know, if I had had my way with the funds that were available for corporate social responsibility and followed my passion, it would have been African wildlife. There would be no justification. That questioner would be absolutely right if the corporate funds were about African wildlife. I put my money there. That's different. That's philanthropy. But it would have no relevance. And unfortunately, what has happened with many corporations with corporate social responsibility is it's become the flavor of the moment depending on who the CEO is. And I would say also sometimes the spouse of the CEO. But it doesn't have connectivity with the business, and it doesn't have legitimacy. So that's the asset test. And Therefore, you, can, you, you also go to be measured. You've put your head above the parapet as well, because now civil society starts asking, well, what are your goals? And you've got to put them out there, and you've got to meet them. So, you know, you've made yourself vulnerable. So other people say, well, why did you do that? Because that's the way that you're able to make a difference. There is another really important piece to this, which is beneficial to the corporation. And this is to do really with values. 
and the values of the company, but the values of the people who work for the company. And I don't think we, we thought about this deeply enough uh, when we went into it, but, but certainly uh, it became evident. If you think, and certainly the company I took over, which was, we had disaffection within, within the ranks. Um, if you think of the way we live our lives, and just about everyone lives their lives with some sort of responsibility to society, something that we do that's extracurricular. It may just be a baseball team, maybe something with the church, or it may be wildlife, or it may be disadvantaged children. It, it, but it, everyone's got some sort of involvement. If you come into the business every day and you don't feel comfortable that the business is ethical and the business is doing the right thing, you know you throw a switch when you walk in the door and you throw a switch at night when you walk back out. What happened as we started addressing these issues and communicating that was the emails started coming to me about how proud they were feeling about the company. You get and, and people volunteering to become involved with water projects because they saw how it, how it connected with the company but also with their own lives. And we looked at the, the engagement scores that we did every year and the engagement scores in terms of how they felt about working for the company and also some more detailed questions kept going up and up and up and up. And then, and this was anecdotal and then we researched it, Headhunter said to us, you know, we're getting people now coming in who want to join the Coca-Cola company or the Coca-Cola system who say that five years ago, Coca-Cola was never on the list. Why? Because it had changed itself. And now the, the pool of talented people that able to track into the company was expanded. So this is a, this is a positive reinforcing loop in every way that you look at it. Very, very positive indeed. And, you know, the, the other piece then is that you are also right where the, your consumer is. Because, again, the research showed us that the new generations are thinking more about a value-based society. They want to know what the values are of your company. What do you stand for? And if you don't pass that test, they will, in one way or another, vote with their feet, or not with their money, let's put it that way. And you'll see the way that Coke has developed working with social media and opening up and talking about these issues. So, how does it, how does it really work in practice? Well, let, let me just tell you, uh, Bridge just mentioned some of the things I do, but as I constructed my retirement, I wanted to stay involved with business, but not with Coca-Cola Company. I believe I chose my successor and I got out of his way. But I'm on the board of General Motors. And I went through the bankruptcy and I just had a board meeting last week, so I have seen the whole evolution of General Motors. So, I, so I'm staying connected very strongly in the business community. I was asked when I announced my retirement to join the board of the World Wildlife Fund, and now I'm the, I'm the chairman of the U.S. World Wildlife Fund on the international board. So here's my civil society, and here's obviously my connection with the environment and with wildlife, etc. And the third piece I do is in Africa, where I was brought up, where I'm involved in uh, government reform. A, uh, a small NGO out of Dar es Salaam, uh, set up uh, really after Glen Eagles and the focus on Africa, where we've got 50 projects running the reform of African governments in areas like commercial courts, land registration, business registration, customs, um, and also uh, inter-Africa trade. But totally reforming processes, a lot of it really by just modernizing, but also with a high element of end-to-end -end process reform, taking steps out of the process, taking some you know, like business registration in uh, Burkina Faso from 17 approvals down to five, and if you want to address corruption, that's one way of addressing corruption, by the way. So I'm involved in that, which gives me a governmental leg. And I have a co-chair. I'm only co-chair of that. And that's Ben Makapa, the former president of Tanzania. And in fact, most of the board are former African ministers of various governments uh, who've excelled themselves in the, in the past. 
So I've kept those, if you take talk the triangle of sustainability, I have got a leg in each piece of that, of that triangle. But let me just tell you how, some examples of how this now works from the World Wildlife Fund side, because the World Wildlife Fund took a great risk. The first major corporate partner they had was Coca-Cola, and there was a great debate within the board, I believe, I wasn't there at the time, uh, of the World Wildlife Fund. And they decided that they'd made the case in many respects, not completely, but in many respects they'd made the case. But what was their implementing capacity? Apart from working with governments and getting legislation put in place and changing you know, cafe standards for cars and working in that arena, but what was their multiplier? Well, they had some multiplier. There's a million members of WWF in the US. But they, they didn't feel they had the heft. Where was the heft? Well, it was mentioned earlier in the introduction of business. So they took the step to start working with Coca-Cola on water. So they were the validator of the water projects. And that's grown into a number of other projects with, with Coca-Cola, but now it's grown into what's called the markets program. And uh, if you want to just look at that in more detail, there's a guy called Jason Clay who heads up that for WWF. And if you, you, Google, or if you go back to TED Talks, um, he talked Jason Clay, WWF on uh, markets. Uh, about two years ago. It's a bit out of date, but it still reflects the program. Um, as a presentation he made at TED. And basically it's a matrix that's been developed, and it's taken 15 largely commodities, but climate change is in there. And that's one, one part of the, uh, of the axis. And the other part of the axis is who, which companies are most involved in each of those areas? And I'll move away from Coke now, and I'll go to palm oil. So as you look at palm oil, you put in the Unilevers and you put in the Col 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 Colgates and the Procter and Gambles. And now you start looking at the effect that palm oil not only has on the environment, but also in terms of species. So let me put it to you this way. You want to save the orangutan? You've got to stop deforestation. You want to stop deforestation? You've got to do two things, actually. You've got to address the pulp and paper industry, and that's there as well. And you've got to address palm oil plantation. And therefore, you now go to these organizations and you say, there's obviously a lot of work goes on before you make this, this presentation, but you very simply say, do you realize the impact you have? Not just on, you don't talk climate change, because don't forget the forest affects climate change. That, then you get into a different argument. You actually start, do you realize that you are killing off the orangutans? That emotive piece <laughs> gets people rather than something that's ethereal, though, though absolutely understandable, I think, climate change, but not to everyone. And then you say, well, and of course, that's because the rainforest is, is being pulled up. And it's being pulled up either for making toilet paper, I'll come to that story in a second, or it's being pulled up to, for palm oil. And do your consumers understand the impact that you're having on their planet? So we'll come back to my comment about value-based society, value-based brands. Is this how you want to be perceived? And it's not how they want to be perceived, because I was not alone in walking this road. If you look at what Paul Pullman was doing at Unilever, he's, he's absolutely along this track and has probably taken it further than... Uh, that certainly has taken it further than I have. So I, I wasn't alone in this. So you, you, you always have early adapters. So we were able to get to some early adapters who were willing to address the issue. And what came out of this, and this happened, my successor pulled this together with the Consumer Goods Forum, top 20 companies, both retailers and uh, manufacturers. And they are starting to come up with common policies, one of which is, that they've said by 2015 they will be able to, and they're, they're able to track this, they will not source any palm oil from newly erected palm forests. It will, they will either go back to degraded land for plantation, or they will just have to try and improve yields in the areas that, where there's existing plantations, but it will really be degraded land. But absolutely stopping what hap has been happening 
that they've been party to the ripping out of the rainforest to plant palm, palm oil trees for them to sell their products. It's a whole different way of looking thing, at things. And it doesn't always come... Th th that discussion was relatively easy. Not at the end of the road yet, because in fact there's one big supplier who happens to be based out of Malaya, who's 40% of the global uh, palm oil market, and we haven't got, to, got there yet, but there's the plan. But that's the evolution you go through. And it's not always, it's not always done easily either. I talked about pulp and paper. There was a brand that was being sold by, so now, now I'm talking about how do you get to not just a developed world pulp and paper business, but how do you get to someone who's the bad actor in the developing world? Because that's going to be one of the questions. This is great. Is this a Western, just a, you know, we're Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we're not going to be able to get to the, the, the base of this. Well, the, the bad player, and I'll name them, was Asia Pulp and Paper. WWF had had some protocols with them to stop them doing, uh, taking down virgin forest. And they hadn't abided by it. So, as you dug deeper, they were actually chopping down forest to supply cheap private label toilet paper to the largest supermarkets in the US, and they had a brand called Paseo. So we took the top 20 supermarkets, and we did what we did with the Unilevers, et cetera. And 10 of them very easily said, we get it. We don't want, if our consumers knew this is what we were doing, this would not be acceptable. This is not, this is not where we are and what, what we are. But 10 of, them, 10 of them pushed back, and then three eventually came. There were seven who didn't, who said, absolutely not. This is something we compete on. You know, the, the weekly ads are all about what's the price of some basic, basic shopping things and toilet papers right up there with Coca-Cola. Um, not that I want to equate the truth, but anyway. Uh, so we then took out a campaign. And we actually named the supermarkets. And we said, these, these supermarkets, here are the people who have stopped doing it. Isn't this wonderful? But here's the ones who are not doing it, who are still continuing. Well, cut a long story short, all 20 are no longer buying from Asian pulp and paper. But to get that done and be sure it was done properly, because there's now a protocol, which Greenpeace was involved in as well, um, and the Indonesian government, because we knew this would be you know, a, something that was embarrassing to the Indonesian government. So well, they were involved. So now there's a protocol that's been signed by Asia Pulp and Paper, by the Indonesian government, by the NGOs, and by some leading businesses, that Asia Pulp and Paper will stop completely sourcing any of their products from virgin, virgin forest. Now, you know, there are technologies to be able to uh, look at this now, but um, the jury's still out. But at least the agreement's there, and we believe that it's, uh, that it's enforceable. So I go to those two really as practical examples. And I park then the government piece uh, right at the beginning. Because, in fact, the laggards are government. And I, I, about 18 months ago, I, had, I put together an event with, um, actually with Georgia State University, uh, where we had Helene Gale of CARE, myself, representing business, and Larry Summers, uh, who you all know, representing government. And we talked about this. And Larry said, he said, absolutely agreed what we're saying about government. He said, the problem is that governments still think that their role is to be the policeman. And they've run out of budgets for police, and they've also absolutely weighed everyone down with so much legislation that it can't be implemented. The policemen can't police anymore and they haven't woken up to the fact that their powers there are not as effective as they were. And they still have this hierarchical, very hierarchical view with regard to not working to the same degree with civil society and with governments. And as I say, he didn't give us a simple solution except that governments need to recognize the limitations of their power in today's world. And of course, this is all enabled by what was talked about earlier. 
this total transformation in terms of communication, this totally new consumer. The ability of one bad incident that happens in one little corner of the world to become a global story literally within minutes. And therefore, the force that comes back, there's a, there's, a, there's a protection here with regard to business. How do you be sure that you are not a bad actor? But to me, it's much more than that. To be a 21st century company, to moving from corporate social responsibility to what I call a socially responsible corporation is where you have to go. And it will be the socially responsible corporations the ones who think about values, who in my view, will prosper in the 21st century. And that's my message to you today. Thank you.